Welcome to the Walking Dead edition of the Indie Film Hustle podcast, episode number 63. Today's quote, guys, comes from our fearless Walking Dead leader, Rick. Take a listen. This is how we survive. We tell ourselves that we are the Walking Dead. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustling walkers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Don't forget to head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free film audiobook from Audible. Today's show is sponsored by Filmmaking Hacks, how to shoot and market your indie film. Just head over to filmmakinghacks.com to download your discounted copy. So guys, today, as you can tell, it's a little bit different. I have gone full deadhead, full Walking Dead. Uh, This is our special Walking Dead edition of the, the podcast, and we have a very special guest this week. We have Vince Gonzalez, who has actually worked on walking dead uh for seasons two and three so he was there very early on and saw the growth and how the cast kind of blew up and uh the whole the whole show like how it started off as like this little quiet little thing and they had no idea how big they got and all this kind of cool stuff he gives us um a lot of information about what he did on the show he was a uh, assistant director and vince has worked on i mean his his credits are insane from Transformers Age of Ex, uh, Extinction, Neighbors, Red Dawn, uh, The Tooth Fairy with The Rock, Step Brothers, uh, as well as Pearl Harbor, uh, Traffic, and then on the TV shows. And, that, and that's not, by the way, he worked on a ton of other movies as well. One of my favorites, Sandlot, Encino Man, and Son-in-Law, and Speed, for God's sakes. I mean, he's worked on a ton of stuff. On TV shows, Walking Dead, uh, Grey's Anatomy, Boston Legal, Charmed, Six Feet Under, the list goes on and on. He is a wealth of information, and I wanted to get him on the show. And it just so happened that uh, this this week is the final episode of the season for Walking Dead, and that he worked on The Walking Dead. I am a huge Walking Dead fan. I was like, well, I got to get you on the show. We're going to talk a lot about an assist being assistant director. Uh, stories from the set, all those kind of cool things. But I dug in deep on what was it like to work on Walking Dead, the processes, how they um, not torture, but raz new directors as they come in and what they do to the new directors. Uh, so on new directors going on to sets of a TV show, always keep an eye out because <laughs> it's it's kind of like a fraternity sometimes. But anyway, guys, uh, it's an awesome, awesome episode. So please uh, enjoy it. Without further ado, my interview with Vince Gonzalez. Vince, man, thank you so much for being on the show, bro. I, I really appreciate you taking out the time. Hi, Alex. How are you? I'm good, brother. Oh, sure. I'm good. It's it's been it's been a few minutes since we've talked. Uh, we worked together. God, how long ago now? Ten years. Uh, ten years ago. It, I know, right? I think it was ten years ago when we worked that. Uh, we did that Naleep thing. Where you were my uh, you were my first assistant director on that project. Oh, that was so fun! It was so much fun. And then I came back the year later to be a teacher, uh, an instructor, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and then we got to know each other on that level, as 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 opposed to me just going crazy running around as a director. <laughs> it was a, you know it was a lot of fun. We created a lot of great work in a very short amount of time. It was a it was a, um, a sort of a camp, uh, an intensive where uh, we took. Uh, young directors for um, a week and we prepped uh, two scenes from their feature film scripts mm-hmm. and uh, shot them over a weekend and with, with real talent crew yeah with, with real talent crew, yeah got some amazing results they had the editors there where they laid music down to it and in say a week we had a, a finished product of these two scenes that we were able to view and look at and uh, with with you know high production value and Hollywood results. Yeah, we were shooting on if I remember the the uh, we were shooting on mini v, mini DV on the Panasonic DVX 100A. Uh little camera. Uh but uh that was a technology 10 years ago. 
No, it was a great, great program. It was. Um, young people or uh, newer filmmakers who had never put the camera down, who mm-hmm. would always held the camera. We took the camera away from them and said, talk to the actors. I know. Yeah. It, it was so weird because I was a director. <laughs> I was I was I was that troubled director, wasn't I? I remember if I remember correctly, I caused a big stink. Because I brought a second camera, uh, I wanted to shoot, I wanted to edit, and I was like, I had no idea how to do anything else until finally the program director, she's like, no, you're not going to do anything, you're going to direct, and you're just going to talk to the actors. And I'm like, but I have a second camera, I want to make this production really great. I'm like, no, you can't use a second camera. <laughs> That's that's true. They give you some trouble about that, but you know they give them all trouble because it was all these directors who had done every who were one man bands, and uh, to give them a professional crew and have them step back and focus on the actors. I mean, you could tell us what that's like because that's got to be a big freedom for you. You know what? I'll tell you the the first time I ever directed something that was not um, that I did not edit was that. I'd always edited uh-huh. everything I'd ever done. So when we did those scenes together. Um, and I had someone else editing and I would walk in and I kind of tell the editor what I wanted and then walk out. I'm like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> right, right. This is nice. But, but, but that, that allows you to also rethink that uh, from being a filmmaker who's, who could be a one man band and get it all done yourself mm-hmm. from beginning to end to uh, uh, trusting the collaborative process and having uh, professionals and other experts and other talented people who are talented in their own fields uh, be part of, of of your piece of art. You know, having twenty artists rather than just you. Oh, absolutely. Now, now we've already we've already digressed, Vince. We haven't yes. even started the interview yet. <laughs> okay, good, good. We just been catching up. Um, so, Vince, uh, I wanted to get you on the show because you have a very unique perspective on the film business. You've been in the film business now for uh, I'm not going to say the years, but a good amount. <laughs> two, yeah, more than two decades let's say. let's say more than two decades absolutely and uh you, i i loved working with you when we worked together and we've stayed in touch over the years and i really wanted to get you in the show to get your perspective on things but first and foremost tell me tell people how you got into the business well um you know i grew up in colorado and i went to school at the university of colorado and i had a um communication class uh, i i I went into the communication school, which is uh, interpersonal communication, and it's because my roommate came. I was un- undeclared as a junior, and my my roommate came home and said, uh, "Hey, uh, I just got in the in the comm school, and there's thirty girls to every guy <laughs> in every class." <laughs> so I said, "Okay, I'm going to be a comm major. Why not?" Right. And uh, um, it, at the comm school, um, I kind of brought in a, a different different ideas. I mean, they wanted me to write a 15 page paper with four other people. And I said, Hey, there's this, I'm taking this VHS. I, I have a, access to a VHS recorder, a camcorder. Uh, would you mind if we just did a video project instead of writing the paper? Can we try that? And the, and the professor was at, up for it, mm-hmm. which was cool. And we did this project and it took the communication department by storm and they loved it. And we all got A's Nice. And you know. Now what is this and, now what is this VHS thing you speak of? <laughs> <laughs> is that like beta? No, I'm joking. Uh <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um but but you know I made a we made a film and a, a film pro, a, a video project rather than writing the papers and and to me it was a better way to communicate and it was exciting for the for the comm school to to see the results of this and the whole class you know, we, we had them and, and they laughed and it was funny and they got the point. So to me, that made me excited about film. And I decided to, to go into the film program and, and make films. Um, and the rest, you As know, they, they didn't history. have a film program there. <laughs> so I, uh, I created my own independent degree and, um, moved to LA, decided I was going to move to LA and make movies. So, and then, and then you, and, and, and I was looking at your, um, your IMDB and you've, You've worked on a, a lot of movies, but in your early career, you worked on some of my favorite films growing up: uh, Sandlot, yeah. Encino Man, uh-huh. Son in Law. Uh, <laughs> those movies. I mean, when I was growing up, I absolutely love. I mean, Sandlot's a classic. I mean, it's, right. it's an amazing. Uh, and you were a PA on these on these. Uh, or starting out, you were just starting out basically right. in your career. So how did you how did you get your first gig? How did you like just get that first foot in the door? Well, I had. Uh... 
I had moved to Florida because it was going to be the new Hollywood. Yes, right? I, I'm in from Orlando. Florida, so I'm, I'm – um, oh, in Orlando even more so. Yes, I, I completely know that that was the, the Right, the they were building Hollywood. the Disney – this Disney Studios were built and they were uh, – had just finished Universal. Yes, huge. Studios and, yes. <laughs> and Spielberg was on uh, on the TV and on the radio saying that Hollywood East is going to – going to give uh going to be a great place to make movies and so i i didn't have a lot of cash when i moved out of college and i moved to we moved to florida to get started we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show and i worked in the film office i was an intern in the film office and i delivered the um permits to the various commercials or whatever was shooting because I wanted to to get to know what was going on, and I'd go to work at the TV station at night because mm-hmm. I had a t- sort of a TV um, background as a floor director. And uh, one day I delivered a permit to an HBO movie, and it was called "Somebody Has to Shoot the Picture" with Roy <laughs> Scheider from Jaws. Of course. And and I met the producer, and I said, "Here's your permit, sir, and here's my resume. I really want to work on your movie." Wow. And he said, well, thanks for the permit. And, um, you know, there's really nothing on your resume that pertains to us, but why don't you call my office and see if they need some help? Uh-huh. And I was like, okay, great. Wow. Yeah. So I called the office and, and, um, they said, yeah, come in tomorrow at 9am. Uh, does, that's the greatest phone call ever, isn't it? it well, well it is. <laughs> and it, it is. And, uh, I went at 9am and I'm, and they said, uh, wait here. And then they, they said, make some, can you make copies of this while, while you're here? And how about making a uh, coffee and here's uh, some money to go to the grocery store and bring back a receipt. And I came back and, and did all these things. And pretty soon I'm saying, uh, well, when am I going to get my interview? You know, I have to go to the TV station at three o'clock <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want to make sure I get my interview done. It's almost two o'clock right now. And they said, what interview? You've been doing the job for half a day. <laughs> I called the TV station. I says, I'm not coming back now or never. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> and I was in the film business. That's hilarious. So you really didn't even know you were in the business. That's how green you were. You had no idea that you had already started working. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. As long as I could follow orders, I think I was doing it. And uh, uh, no, that was really a lot of a lot of fun. And it doubled my salary. And and uh, that job lasted three weeks. Mm-hmm. So at the end of two weeks, I'm starting to say, well, what? we're, we're going to finish in one more week. And I gave up a solid full-time job. And mm-hmm. and what am I going to do? Right. And everyone there says, you know what? Uh, we all work. Uh, you'll work again. And I said, I don't have any experience. She said, stay in touch with everyone on the show uh-huh. that you met and you'll work again. So I was really nervous and, and kind of scared, but I just kept doing a good job. And um, amazingly, the production company picked up another show. I was down for a week before they said, hey, come back to work. We're going to we need you to do some pickups and some deliveries and get started again. And I was like, wow, that fast. Great. It's 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 it. You know, I've been a freelancer all my all my adult life in the film industry, pretty much only other than two jobs that I had, which I was gloriously fired from. Um, I'm very proud of my firings. I, I, I wear them as badge of honors. Um, you, you know, you're no one in this business until you've been fired. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I, I I know there's that whole like, oh, God, what am I going to do? Am I going to work next week or not? And that's only towards the beginning. Uh, but once you, once you like, oh, work just starts to come. And it is something that uh, – my wife took years to finally get comfortable with. <laughs> it's, it's, we're carnies. We're it's carnies, true. Vince. We're carnies. We're, we're carnival it's, folks. It's true. I'm trying to sell your mother-in-law on the fact that you uh, <laughs> it took, it <laughs> don't took, have a regular job at listen, a regular corporation. Listen, and, uh, I, listen to, I tell you what. My, my wife's family for three years <laughs> kept asking her. And he just like, what does Alex do again? <laughs> like they couldn't – they just didn't grasp the idea. Like – what is Alex doing? And then finally, after three, you're like, "Well, there's been food on the table, so apparently he does something, and it's and it's not illegal." So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my neighbors are skeptical. <laughs> exactly. Now, can you now? With that said, can you talk a little bit about the importance of relationships in the business and how imperative it is to maintain 
those relationships over the course of your career to main, be able to work? Well, sure. That was that was some of the best advice that someone gave me. Is that we all work somewhere, and if you stay in touch with all of us, you know, someone's going to go somewhere, and they're going to need someone. So that's really um, what you do: is you start that, you meet that first crew, and you stay in touch with everyone there, and they all go different directions because there's that many different projects, and um, you know, you just go one to the other, and and. Uh, What's strange about the business is you'll end up with having choices because it all comes at once, of course. You of, know, course. Anything, of course. And then all of a sudden you have four different directions to go and and you're choosing for your career. Do I want to go work for the art department? You know, when you're a PA, mm -hmm. they have you do different things. Do I want to work in the accounting department? Do I want to work with the assistant directors? Mm -hmm. And Or do I want to work in camera? So, um, so that's... Uh, you know, important decisions. And you always wonder, you know, if you went the right direction, if you made the right decision, uh, the producer kind of, on that first show kind of helped me, mm -hmm. uh, make the right decision because I had, I had worked with cameras and I had made films in college and, and I said, I wanted to be a camera assistant. I want to be a loader, mm -hmm. which was the bottom, <laughs> loader. bottom level. Now, please explain to, to the younger audience members what a loader does, because <laughs> I know what a loader does, but <laughs> right. right back then, um, you know, the loader actually loaded the film in a dark room, uh, offset into the camera. So you, you can't do it on the set, do you? Or in a bag. Or, it, or in a bag. In a bag, if you, you had yeah. to keep it dark. I mean, if you open it to any light, it's exposed and it's no good. It's That's what they say. Um, it flashed. The, the, the film got flashed or something. If it was exposed to any light, it'd be no good. So uh, the loader had to go offset. and Very stressful, I would imagine. You know, the most important job. <laughs> I, it, it's truly like literally there's millions of dollars in your hands uh, <laughs> every day because if you – and I, I know this because I was on set many times that, you know, you, they would hand you over, a, you know, a, you know, a roll and they might have just shot – you know, might have cost $100,000 to shoot, the, you know, well, five well, hours or whatever long it took to get this these shots and they give it to a right. – <laughs> Give it to a twenty-year-old. Give it to the least amount of experience and say, "Hey, make sure you load and unload this film without flashing it." And then at the end of the day, after you've shot the entire day, which might be a, a hundred thousand dollar day, right. they hand it to a PA to drive it to the lab. And, uh, and really the producer said to me when I drove film to the lab, he said, "If you have an accident, put the film in the ambulance." <laughs> Time to take it out. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was one part of the filmmaking process that I think wasn't thought out properly uh, over over the course of, of the many decades that the film industry has been around at this point. The most important jobs to the least experienced people. Though. Yes, exactly. Which it's, I mean, it's trial by fire, uh, to say the least. So, um, you know, one of the funniest things is I had a, an old DP friend of mine who used to um, – just to mess with the, the PAs, they would uh, – he would throw a lens at them. To catch, but it was a broken lens and it was an old broken lens, so it had no value. But he just throw it, <laughs> He'd like here, catch. And when they drop it, he would lose. You know, it's just you know the on set pranks. <laughs> yeah, that that may be you know the, the responsibility on um, is given to those people because I guess you know you on a film crew you are ultimately very responsible for your position mm -hmm. from the beginning. Oh yeah, so. no, absolutely. Now you went down the path of. Uh, assistant directing, uh, right. and so can you tell uh, to tell the audience a little bit about what an assistant director does, and then the different kind of assistant directors because there there seems to be hundreds of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, uh, an assistant director is part of the director's guild, which is part of the director's team. So there's a director and a first assistant director and a second assistant director, and you know various other assistant directors behind below that that might work on the team but there's only usually maybe um three assistant directors mm -hmm. on every feature film so it's a very competitive position whereas there might be 10 grips seven to ten grips mm -hmm. you know or seven to ten electricians mm -hmm. or four or five prop people or four or five wardrobe people right. you know the the three assistant directors are very competitive they're picked by the director most of the time to uh to schedule and break down um, the film, what we do is we they give us a script and we go into a room and and um, the next day we come out or a couple days or a couple weeks and we come out with a a schedule 
and the director. Um, we've talked to him but or, or her, and we asked him, um, you know, basically this is our schedule. We're going to start in this room. We're going to do this, depending on actors' availabilities, depending on the set's availabilities, depending on daylight or nightlight. So you have all these meetings during prep. But uh, we come out, the first AD makes a schedule. The second AD helps uh, execute the schedule. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, for him. Mm-hmm. And if you have a second, second AD is what they call it. So mm-hmm. It's odd, but that's the way it, it's read. And uh, that person kind of uh, uh, writes a production report and about what happened. So one's dealing with the future, one's dealing with the present, one's dealing with the past. Oh, that's, ac- that's actually a really great way of explaining it. <laughs> I, I hope it makes sense. Um, um, but, uh, you know, we're like the managers of the set, so we're giving information to the crew constantly and uh, also keeping track of overtime and keeping track of uh, staying on schedule. So if the movie's not on schedule, it really comes down on the assistant directors to be efficient. Right. It, uh, I've had I've had experiences working with wonderful assistant directors like yourself, and I've had experiences working with not uh, good assistant directors. And I really didn't never knew early in my career. I really didn't understand what a, a real good first assistant director does. But they they crack the whip. They actually keep they keep everything moving forward to a certain extent. I could only imagine because you've worked with some major major league directors um how yeah. how do you crack the whip on a michael bay <laughs> well, you know it comes down he wants the same thing you do he wants to accomplish all the schedule as well as get the performance so it's up to us to tell him hey in this five minutes that we have down do you want to take uh the actors from the next scene and go into the other set and rehearse for four of those five minutes mm-hmm. and get an idea of what you're doing so that when we go over there we can just nail it, uh, and and things like that. Just try and work ahead and use every minute that you can on on the day. Because if you don't, you know, it gets behind you. We, we put it this way sometimes: if uh, you know, if you have sixty people on the crew, usually the crews are on bigger shows are one hundred and twenty or one hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. But let's say a medium small TV show, that if you have sixty people on the show and each person gets uh, two minutes to waste or you're waiting for them for two minutes, I mean, that ends up to be two hours of the day. Right. So so you can't afford that. You ha- everything has to be uh, happening like clockwork all at once. It's got to tick like a Swiss clock. Right. And if not, you go into OT and you start going into – I mean, I'm, like I was telling you, like when I worked with, with the first AD, I was shooting something and the first AD was inexperienced and I smelled it the second he was on set and it was too late by the time he was on set. And the crew ate him alive, just it just ate him alive. And I'm yeah. I, I literally had to pull him up. So I'm like, dude, you've got to start controlling this set. If not, I can't get my day. And then it turns into the screaming first AD, which right. which is like not helpful at all. Like uh, like you yelling is not helping anybody. No one, it, it doesn't work. So I had to I'm like, dude, you got to stop yelling. So he had absolutely no idea what he was doing, and I was just so upset at the production manager who hired him. I'm like, guys, go seriously. You know, so, you know, I ended up having to kind of control the set a little bit uh, because with a seasoned crew, I mean, it, it, we really are, Vince, kind of like carnies. You know, it's yeah. like we're a group of carnival folk who go out to make a movie and the more experienced guys will razz the, the least experienced guys. It's just part <laughs> of the process. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you walk on the set, they smell the blood instantly. They're yeah. like, oh, Oh, hey, he's the one. So it's 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 a rough it's a rough environment being on a professional set sometimes if you're not a professional. <laughs> uh, well, as I said, it's a tough it's a tough crowd, and they're all very smart, and they're all experts at what they do. Right, and nobody wants their time wasted. Yes. So it, exactly, exactly. So uh, <laughs> now I'm going to geek out a little bit and talk about uh, one of my favorite TV shows on, on TV right now, The Walking oh, yeah. Dead. Oh, uh, yeah. And you worked on The Walking Dead in season two and three. So right. uh, please, can, can, I, can you tell me a little bit about how that experience was? Because you, you were at the beginning of The Walking Dead phenomenon. Now right. it's, I don't even know what season, I think they're on six or something like that, five or six at this Probably. point, uh, if not more. And they've become, you know, the, the I honestly, I think they are the, the biggest, the highest, highest rated television show on on TV at this point, um, if not close to it. 
Um, but at the beginning, even season two was still the craziness hadn't kicked in yet. So you kind of saw it's between two and three. I'm imagining you saw a big change in a lot of stuff that was going on. Can you tell us any stories or, or how that experience well, was? Well, I'll, st- I'll start at the beginning. And even after 20 years experience, this is how getting the job goes. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm coming, I'm flying to Colorado. I just finished a week on, uh, the, the, oh, I'm stumbling here. Uh, uh, a show the God, the motorcycle show. Oh, uh, oh God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, sons of anarchy. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I'm, uh, I just get off a plane. I had done a week on sons of anarchy doing a second unit and additional first unit stuff. Mm-hmm. And I get off the plane in, in Colorado where I was going to take a break and my phone has a message on it. And, and I, I checked the message. It says, um, how soon are you available and interested in working on a show in Atlanta? How soon can you be here? Well, it's Memorial Day weekend. And I called him right back on the tarmac and said, uh, my bag is still packed. <laughs> <laughs> I can fly right now. You know, I'm in Denver. If, you know, book me a ticket. I'll go. And that's kind of how these jobs go because he, they said, all right, you've got the job, but we'll do We'll let you have a uh, Memorial Day off. Uh, you'll fly on Memorial Day, by the way, <laughs> and, of course. and uh, be here for the day after that. Oh, and that's said, awesome. Okay, great. And I said, what am I doing? And she, they said, it's a, it's a little show called The Walking Dead, and you're replacing a second AD there. And I said, uh, okay, great. So I'm coming in with no prep. You know, you, you have I don't no idea what, what the this... job is, and I had agreed to it. You had no, but you knew the person obviously who was offering it to you. No, I mean this was someone that I just met on the phone. Oh, really? Are, are, are you interested and available for this show? <laughs> and I said yes. And then I then I say, well, by the way, what's the show? Right. And you <laughs> had no little, idea about zombies. You had no idea about. Uh, you know, I'd heard about the show uh, in season one. It was really starting to gain some ground. Of course, yeah. there's, there's there's a big little zombie show going on. And they said, well, this is called The Walking Dead. It's in Atlanta. I'm like, is that? that zombie show i don't know yeah. <laughs> so i got on the plane and i flew in and and uh, i land i'm replacing a second ad who was going off to do something else and and uh, uh my first day on set i walk on to uh in season two the, the barn massacre oh and god they, oh I jesus get out of the van, so, uh, by the way spoiler alerts <laughs> <laughs> we'll see it's season two so it's it's the past but yeah. i get out of the van and these guys are pouring um, ju- jugs of uh, of blood on around people who are lying on the ground, oh, and then I realize some of those people are dummies, and they're pouring blood around the dummies. And these, it looks like a train wreck, you know, like a train hit a school bus or something. It was a mess. <laughs> this so, is your first day on the set. This is my first day on. Now, <laughs> my eyes must have been as big as you know chocolate chip cookies because the DP or the 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 camera operator comes up to me, Mike Setrazemis, who's now the DP uh-huh. and the director. He comes up, puts his arm around me. He says, "It's your first day, isn't it, buddy? It, it, it'll it'll get better. It'll, <laughs> you'll think it's funny very soon. It, it's okay because I I look like I was gonna throw up or something." Oh, that's hilarious. And so, uh, yeah. After a while, you have to you had to just treat it as tongue in cheek because it looks so real, and you're standing there in the middle of this mess, and and uh, Everyone else is laughing and saying, "Yeah, hey, yeah, put a little more over there." Look, no, no, we need the darker blood for this one. Oh, great, great. okay. Go no, grab that arm. For this one. This yeah. Is fresh. Yeah. Go grab that arm. I need another carcass. Get another yeah, yeah. carcass Go in here. The arm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so they're all having a great time with it. I was horrified, but uh, you know, it, it, after a day or two, it, it started to sink in that uh, hey, this is the funnest part of movie making, where you know you're making it crazy. It's all about make believe, and it's nothing to have, having to do with anything that's real or or any representative of that, it's just a, it's a lot of fun making make believe. And here we go. And it was just, and, and, and then, the, and then you stayed on for two seasons. We, we went from there and the actors are going to, uh, to do a, a photo shoot for Vogue uh-huh. and they come back and they're like, we just did a photo shoot for Vogue. We just did a photo shoot for entertainment weekly. Uh-huh. And then they went to Comic-Con and they came back and they said, Oh my God, you guys, Oh, oh my God. God, you won't believe how huge we are because we're shooting in this tiny little town right. south of Atlanta. 
And they said there was a line a mile and a half outside around the arena just to see us. And we, you know, we're, we're all pretty ins- proud of that. That's pretty. Yeah, and, and I've heard that before from other shows. It was like, I think uh, Sarah Michelle Geller said that about Buffy because when she originally was doing oh. Buffy. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. They're in the, you're in a, you're in a production bubble. Like you, right. you, your whole life, you don't even see the outside world. You just, you just keep making the show. Right. And, and then the first time you step out, you don't even like, you're not even on the streets. You're not even reading the <laughs> paper. Like you just, the show, that's, that's all you do. And that's, I that's guess. all you have time for, right? Right. It's all you have time for. <clears throat> and then I guess uh, from their point of view, they're in Atlanta. So they're in the, they're not like in Hollywood. So you're in Atlanta. So you're in a bubble inside of a bubble. Uh, yeah. And then. Like, like, yeah, it's someone, I guess we just did a photo shoot for Vogue, I guess something. And oh yeah, I did a photo shoot for entertainment. And then of course, Comic-Con is the ultimate. And they're like, gee, I could only imagine that experience. It must be insane. So then of well, course you guys are all like, Hey, we're on walking dead. That's awesome. Well, you know, we just keep making, making the thing and, and all the actors are, are a great young cast who, you know, may not have had uh, a lot of, uh, big, uh, big shows before right and these kids were becoming stars and to be with them while they're becoming stars is a great experience and it's a lot of fun because you're sharing that experience with them you know that wonder of uh of wow people really like us and someone's out there you know there's millions of people watching us and the show gets bigger and bigger and pretty soon we're um our ratings are better than monday night football or uh, Sunday night NFL shows, which, which you know, oh no, you're right. always beat everything, right? But this show, like the show, is insane, and it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now I know you told me you haven't seen many of the episodes after the episodes you've worked on, so I won't talk to you about any of those. Okay, <laughs> but you know, I get I get busy. I, I went on to the to the next hit show. I was exploring other opportunities, and and uh, in in that, you know, I'm back in my production bubble where uh, day day night and. <laughs> I'm uh, eating, sleeping, drinking the show. Right, which is exactly. the way I have to work. It's it's what we got to do. Exactly. Now, uh, what was it? I mean, the, the the Walking Dead is a show that has a lot of logistics as far as extras and makeup, and I mean prosthetics. Oh God, yeah. It's so that must be for for a first or second uh, AD. It must be a, a massive thing to undertake because I can. I, I mean, just doing a normal show. Where you just have, you know, oh, I got how many people on set today? Okay, we've got seven people on set. Maybe we've got maybe a party scene with 30, 40 people on set. And they just, oh, how are they dressed? Great, great, great. But you've got like zombies. So the, all of the, and the zombies look insane. So I can imagine what the makeup <laughs> process goes through. So can you explain like the most hectic day you had on the show? Well, well, it's, it's true. Walking onto that show um, was walking on to the hardest show that I've ever done in my life because, because of all those elements. I mean, you have a cast that was 11 or 13 cast members every single day from the top of the day to the end of the day. They're all together, you know, they're, right. the band. they're in everything. And then you add um, two hours of makeup on various walkers that uh, are going to be in close-ups. Hero, and hero then walkers. you have another 30 walkers that are mids is what we call them. Right. And then you have, you know, the deep walkers. If you really needed a big crowd, then you'd have a number of them that were deep that their makeup wasn't as good as the, as the heroes. Right. Um, so, um, that process starts way early in the morning and, and these people were starting to come in at three thirty in the morning. And when I got there, I, I said, this, this process is, this is too hard to have a TV show. If we had a feature, we could get through it because then there'd be months of rest after a couple of weeks. <laughs> right. But this is the but this is a TV show that had six months to go or something. And, <laughs> right. you know, someone was going to crash their car on the way to work or on the way home because they're not getting rest. Right. So, so I talked to the producers and I said, we need to fix this. We can't come in at three 30 in the morning to get these people started without adding 10 more personnel to, to do split shifts. So, uh, a kind of a management thing and an experience thing, and and I just uh, said, listen, this is we could make this work if we start coming at five thirty. If we only have nine heroes at the top of the day, and I can still give you thirteen cast members, you know, it's kind of what 
what I know that we can push out of our factory as far as uh, hair, makeup, wardrobe, and and walkers. And the producers, I was lucky the producers worked with me on that. Everyone was glad to get a, another hour or two of rest. And the show only gets better when everyone's well rested. So Right. Uh, yeah, because so, you can burn out. Yeah. On a show like that, I'm imagining you could burn out. And not right. only burn out, but you're thinking about people getting hurt. like you, like, you And that's what a first AD and a second do. They think about what could happen and what, you know, like something like that. Like I remember I've been on many productions where like, yeah, we, we can't do a turnaround like that. People need 12 hour turnaround, you know, you know, and you're thinking like, if you keep doing this, someone's going to crash their car. Someone's going to get hurt. Right. And that's, that's, and we're making movies. We're not, we're not right. doing anything that's more important than a, a little bit of make believe. So, so they understand. And, and that um, reasoning went far and the, uh, uh, plus, we're dealing with outdoor conditions. You know, we're shooting out in the uh, grass that's and, waist high, and it's a little humid. I, I hear it's a little humid there, <laughs> just a little bit. A little humid. Yeah. You know, the temperature is only about a hundred and one. You know, for most, it's of the like summer. Orlando all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Luckily, yeah. no gators. Yeah, no gators. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. But you have you know thousands of zombies, so I don't know which is worse. <laughs> right. No, you know, I, I just have to hand it to the cast and and the and the, even the the extras, the walkers, because they were so excited about the show. They'd come on with all this enthusiasm, and and the actors are standing in the grass and ticks and chiggers. Yeah, and you know we'd have the locations go down and beat down the grass so that the uh, the snakes would go away. <laughs> <laughs> These and are things. It's only a hundred and one degrees out and humid. So, but isn't it uh, isn't it know. glamorous being in the film industry? Yeah, it's, it's just great. <laughs> it's super glamorous being in the film. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and hearing this kind of story, people forget that when they're watching it, they just like it. Like it's not easy. It's not all like in a studio, comfortable air conditioning. They're out there doing it all the time, and those actors kill themselves working. I mean, look, I mean, in, in the scope of if scope of jobs in the world, it's not the worst job in the world, but it is hard work without question. Um, and I can only imagine what it's like being in those that full zombie makeup in 101 degrees in a oh my yeah. God. trying not to melt <laughs> more melt more because <laughs> I already melt melted. more. Uh, and and the actors aren't going to you know these gigantic motor homes where they can go cool off in between takes because we're moving so fast and doing so much work and the trailers are a mile away that they're sitting on set with us um, you know sweating through their clothes just like everyone else and that's what what makes them makes the show great is because the cast works just as hard as a crew on uh, on doing their thing and they know what it's like so. So they're there for us. Right. So it's kind of like a, an army regimen. Like you guys are all fighting in the battle together against the elements to try to get this, this movie made. I mean, get the it, shows made. It's an experience that, that you have, a, you, you have few experiences in life that are like that, where you, something is so hard and everyone goes through it that you're bonded for life. Right. You, even though you only worked on season, not only, but you worked on season two and three, the, it's, Those people are great friends of mine, right? And I see them once in a while at uh, a comic con or a uh, a Walker stalker. And the experience we've gone through never goes away. We're you know you're friends for life. You're you're bonded. And that's something I think in in the film industry is unique uh, in a, in a way because when you when you make a movie when you shoot a show, it's like going into a battle together. And and when you both make it out uh, or all of you make it out on the other side. Um, you know, you and I, at the beginning of this conversation, we're talking about, you know, a week that we shot 10 years ago, you know, like, I, I, you know, and it's something that like, oh, you remember when we did this and that happened and, oh, we made it. It's, it, there is, there is a, a, a uh, you know, like a, a bond that is made in right. production. Uh, and then that's why certain people work with the same crew throughout their career, like Clint Eastwood, Ron Howard. And, you know, when you find people that you can, can kind of really work with. Um, you take them with you and you just, well, you, you, yeah, you trust, you trust them in situations that, that, uh, you don't want to be in without them. Right. Like if you're, yeah, exactly. Like if you're in a foxhole, <laughs> who do you want? Someone you just, you just hired or someone who's been in the battle with you three or four other times. And that's where those relationships are so, so important. Um, where it, it just, 
those relationships are so important, not only for getting work, but also creating good work going down the line. Um, so, so important. Now, I'll, I'll ask one final question. I'll walk in then and then we'll move on. Uh, is What's the funniest uh, story you can share from the set? Oh. Uh... We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Well, I'll, uh, um, you, you know, there, there's pranks all the time. There's stuff going on all the time. And humor is really the only way we get through it. And you really have to laugh every day or you, you know, you wonder why you're doing in this business. If you're not laughing every day, right. or having a good time with it, you know, find something else. But that are maybe that's what keeps us in it is because we are having such a good time every day. But, um, I would go on a scout. Some of the funny stuff is, is, uh, uh, I'll tell you two things. We'd go on a scout with a new director who hadn't been there and we'd be standing on the side of the road and, and the director would walk into the field and say, the scene's going to be out here. And he'd say, why don't you guys come out here? And we're all, we're all standing on the road saying, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, come on, guys, we're going to do the scene out here. And we're like, yeah, we understand. We've we've seen enough. And uh, he's, he's like, you sure you don't want to come out here? We're like, no, because that field is full of ticks and chiggers and snakes. And um, he's like, oh, I'm only out here for, for two minutes. And he's already walking back to the road at that point because we scared him. Right. And the next day, he's got chiggers on his belt line, and he's itching, and he's miserable. Oh. <laughs> because, uh, you know, you know uh, so, you know, that's that's one of the funny stories. And then, uh, you know, another one is uh, we're doing a – we're, we're going to smash a, a walker's head, and, and they load the walker's head up with a bunch of uh, uh, bloody gook mm-hmm. and gack and, and stringy bits of whatever right. that they, the magic they put in there. And um, everyone backs up about 15 feet <laughs> and <laughs> right. the actor's ready to smash it and the director's standing right there and he looks at us back there and he's like, why, why, what are you guys doing back there? And we're like, nothing, nothing. And he goes, okay, action, smash, splatter all over his pants. Oh, and his nice. And uh, we're just right at the splatter. And we're like, you know, yeah, we've been here before, <laughs> but we don't need to get blood all over us every day. So, <laughs> so it seems so like you guys. A new director, you know, it's every time a new director came. Yeah, I was going to, every time a new director came in, apparently you guys just uh, razzed them. Yeah, it's a, it's initiation. So <laughs> now, can you tell me a, a big difference between working on a TV show uh, and working on big, huge tentpole movies like Transformers or Pearl Harbor? In TV shows we crank out a lot of work a day. We crank out probably seven or eight minutes of the show a day mm-hmm. because you only have a seven or an eight day schedule, and uh, a feature might have a sixty five day schedule if it's a trans. Because it's a big movie and they can go over a week if they need to. Gotcha. Uh, they, of course, they don't ever want to. They don't ever want to because they're budgets for a certain amount of time. But um, we shoot a lot less uh, dialogue because you can spend more time on the action. Action takes a, you know, an action might an action scene where you flip a car or something might take half a day mm-hmm. compared to the actors talking for two minutes in the car beforehand that might take you know just a couple hours so it's it's all kind of the art of um scheduling (laughs) inanimate things right Uh, so vince can you tell me what what lesson took you the longest to learn in the film industry oh my gosh you know there's so many and i always think that um you know i might be successful because i made so many mistakes so you you can't be a afraid to make mistakes and you can't be afraid to get um uh have someone you know teach you a quick lesson by you know i i hate to say that i've been i've been yelled at the most i think for for the many (laughs) many 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 things uh for giving information wrong or not or giving not giving it completely or giving it to the wrong person and not the department head or you know any silly mistake someone new in the business is going to make you know they have to be uh taught what's the right way so you have to have a thick skin 
and it's nothing personal and it, don't take it home at the end of the day if you've got your if you got beat up all day because you know that's part of the learning process and those people end up being the best the best uh people to work with because they have made those mistakes and they won't make them again i guarantee you so let me ask you uh, um real quick vince where can people find you vegansalls.com or vince gonzalez denver comic con page on facebook Vince, man, thanks again so much for taking the time out to talk to the Indie Film Hustle tribe. I really appreciate it, brother. Hey, Alex. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you having me. Thanks a lot. Vince is, man, a wealth of information. Man, He was dropping value bombs like crazy in this episode. And it was so much fun to listen to how the the cast uh, and crew of uh, Walking Dead were at the very beginning of the phenomenon uh, it's always interesting to me to, how, to, see how, to see how they were and how kind of in a bubble they were down in Atlanta shooting. So uh, it was great to have Vince on. So I really appreciate uh, him coming on. Uh, if you guys want the show notes for the show, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 063. You can get links for everything we've talked about in this show. And don't forget to head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com. That's FilmmakingPodcast.com to leave a review of the show, hopefully a positive one. Uh, it really helps us out a lot, guys. It helps to get more eyes and ears onto what we're doing at Indie Film Hustle and help more and more independent filmmakers around the world. So filmmakingpodcast.com. Thank you guys, as always, um, for being loyal, loyal listeners to the show. The podcast is growing like weeds. It's insane how fast it's growing and how the listener base is growing. So guys, thank you so much for, for listening. I really humbly appreciate everything uh, you guys do. So please spread the word. I want more filmmakers to be listening to not only my podcast, but there's a bunch of good filmmaking podcasts out there uh, as well that we that, that give a lot of great information. So I want more and more filmmakers to know that there's great information and knowledge on podcasts. So thanks again, guys. Keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. You still don't get it. None of you do. We know what needs to be done, and we do it. We're the ones who live. You, you just... Sit and plan and hesitate. You pretend like you know when you don't. You wish things weren't what they are. Well, you want to live? You want this place to stay standing? Your way of doing things is done. Things don't get better because you want them to starting right now we have to live in the real world we have to control who lives here that's never been more clear to me than it is right now me me you 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 mean me your way's gonna destroy this place gonna get people killed it's already gotten people killed and i'm not gonna stand by and just let it happen if you don't fight you die i'm not gonna stand by thanks for listening to the indie film hustle podcast at indiefilmhustle.com that's i-n-d-i-e-f-i-l-m-h-u-s-t-l-e.com